Uh, thanks everyone for coming um, and a really big thanks to the organisers um, this is a great Evo Lang and I want to particularly thank them for raising um, so much funds for student visitors it's absolutely fantastic that so many of my students and other students from around the world were able to, to come here and were supported so um, generously so thank you very much for that um, a fantastic job um, so it's great to be talking at Evo Lang. Um, it's been, uh, uh, I guess, what, about 15 years that this conference series is running. And I, when I was uh, writing this talk, I was thinking back to uh, the earliest, the first Evo Lang back in Edinburgh in 1996. And um, remembering around about that time, um, I think it was the year before, uh, this book a book with this cover by John Maynard Smith and Ash Sotmari, two distinguished biologists, had just come out on the major transitions and the evolution. And I remember a lot of the talk at the conference was how kind of excited people were that they'd included language as their last, or part of the last major transition in evolution. And it felt very exciting that um, uh, the biologists thought that language is important. So it's kind of interesting to reflect on that and to see how the field has changed um, and the relationship between um, the study of language evolution and biology has shifted as well. But I think it's a good place to start to sort of think about uh, the problem we're, that we're facing in the widest possible context. So um, why did uh, Maynard Smith and Urs Sotmari put language there as the last of the major transitions? And what they were really interested in was the idea that there are certain points in the history of life where there is a kind of step change in the way information is transmitted. And the reason they put language up there with everything else was because, as Ersch puts it, language in our species allows for um, the unlimited heredity of cultural information. So there's something about the, the nature of language that allows us as a species to pass on uh, cultural information and accumulate cultural information in radically new ways. So that's why they put it there. So if that's true, that language enables this unlimited transfer of un information in a, um, in a novel way in our species, that's a hugely adaptive trait. So in some sense, it seems like a very reasonable place to start for thinking about the evolution of language, to think, well, if we have language that's enabling our species to do this, and it's enabled us to do things like uh, you know, build civilizations, um, extend our habitat out into space. All these things wouldn't be possible without language, without the cultural, um, unlimited uh, cultural evolution it provides. If that's adaptive, that seems like a reasonable place to start to try and think about the uh, evolution of language. Um, but before we get there, if we get there at all, um, we need to think about how is it that language is able to do this for us? What is it about language at its you know, most fundamental level that enables us to have this unlimited cultural heredity? Well, I think the answer to that is language has particular, unique, structural design features. That the very, I mean, the, the kind of things I'm going to be talking about are very, very basic. They really are the first thing that we say to students in the first class in Linguistics 101, these design features of language that um, are you know, fundamental and basic. And there are these design features that really give language this unique uh, property of being able to transmit information. And yet, I think we don't have definitive answers for how they got there. And that seems a little bit of an embarrassment if it's the thing that we talk about first in Linguistics 101. So what are these uh, uh, features of uh, language structure that we need to look at? So here's a, a very sort of cartoonish slide of what I think they are. Um, basically, when we, uh, when we use language, uh, we're mapping between two domains. We're mapping between a domain of sound, so here's an acoustic waveform, and a domain of meaning in some sense. Okay, so here's um, an expression in uh, English, two boots. Uh, that's the acoustic waveform for that expression, and that's um, what it means. 
And the interesting thing about language is that the way we map from one to the other, the way that you decode um, an utterance like that or an expression like that, it involves um, various interesting structural properties. And here are two. Here are the two that I think are most important and most fundamental. Um, firstly, the uh, sound of two boots is made up of uh, meaningless elements that combine. So these are uh, uh, phonetic segments. And secondly, those meaning, meaning, meaningless elements combine together to make meaningful elements that also combine. So we can think of these two processes or these two features of the structure of the communication system we're using right now as combinatoriality in the first part and compositionality in, in the second. Now, I could have used the word duality of patterning here, but in fact, I, I kind of don't want to get into the subtleties of it because there are some very, very interesting and rather technical uh, issues about the term duality of patterning and how it relates to um, uh, things like double articulation in the history of linguistics that I don't really want to get into. I just uh, do, So I'm being a bit more cartoonish here and just saying that there's these two properties of combinatoriality and compositionality in language. If you're interested in this, um, I'm editing a special issue of Language and Cognition on duality of patterning where we sort of go into a um, various authors are going to go into this in a lot more detail. So language is special because it use, uh, makes extensive use of these two properties, combinatoriality and compositionality. And um, very few, if any, other communication systems in nature do this. Okay. And it's these two properties that allow us, more than any other property of language, that allow us to uh, convey novel meanings. It means that I can produce sentences uh, to you, you lot, many of whom um, I've never met before. Um, I can produce sentences that I've never said before and you've never heard before, and yet you're able to understand me. And it's because I'm able to recombine elements in novel ways using these two properties. And it's that that allows language to support a system of unlimited information transfer. And that's why language is important as a biological phenomenon. So these would appear to be very adaptive properties of language. So how do we go about explaining um, these adaptive structural properties, these adaptive design features? And it's, it seems to me it's the job of all of us in this room to solve this problem. I mean, that's what language evolution should really be about, explaining these. And that's what you know, many of the talks that I've heard so far, probably all of them, at some one level or another, are tackling this question, and that's great. So uh, what we need to do is think about what kinds of uh, mechanisms and processes might help us solve this problem. Now, there's an obvious one, um, and that's biological evolution, right? So uh, we, let's say again, another cartoon. It's early in the morning, so uh, there'll be a few of these. But we can think of the process of biological evolution as essentially something like this, that we have, uh, we inherit genes that in some complex process give us brains that have um, a, a capacity or a faculty for um, acquiring language. And so if we want to look at the evolution of um, this phenomenon, then we can look at uh, the processes that um, uh, drive the the transmission of genetic information, so biological inheritance. And so obviously language evolution must deal with this. It must deal with the evolution of the cognitive apparatus involved in language, the language faculty. But an interesting thing um, across these series of Evolang conferences has been an increasing emphasis of another inheritance mechanism that's involved um, with language. Um, and that's uh, cultural transmission. Okay? So the language faculty evolves biologically, but languages themselves, the phenomenon that we're talking about, um, evolves culturally. Okay, so that's a completely uncontroversial statement, I hope. I mean, certainly, um, we can see it happening. We can see it happening in studies of language change. We can see it happening in studies of creolization. Um, this process by which languages are passed um, from brain to brain is a cultural process, but it's happening through brains that themselves potentially evolving biologically. So we have these two systems, this dual inheritance of language. 
And um, increasingly over the last decade or so, people have people interested in the uh, evolution of language, interested in the origins of these basic design features, have been wondering whether this process, this process of cultural transmission, has an important role to play in explaining those uh, design features themselves, rather than just focusing on the biological evolution of the language faculty. And we call this, the study of this process, uh, iterated learning, for reasons that I hope will become Come clear. So the study of the particular kinds of cultural uh, transmission that underpin uh, the, trans the transmission of language um, we call iterated learning. So that's what I'm going to um, focus on for most of this talk, but then towards the end I'll bring back in this process and see how these two things work together. So the cultural evolutionary approach is what I'm I'm going to be talking about. So I'll just give you a quick breakdown of what we're going to go through in this talk. Um, first, I'm going to review um, a bunch of experimental work, mostly done in Edinburgh, but not entirely, um, showing that iterated learning, this cultural process, can deliver us uh, the structural adaptations that I'm interested in. Um, so I'm going to actually review five experimental studies. We'll try and get through them. Um, many of them are, are presented in more detail um, in the rest of this conference, so I'll, I'll give you pointers to where you can hear, uh, hear these studies in more detail by the people who are actually working on them. So it's going to be an overview of these five uh, experimental studies. Um, and then I'm going to move on to um, a very quick summary of uh, very recent modelling results, also going to be presented here, um, showing that Iterated learning, this, this cultural process, has extraordinarily um, significant effects on the way biological evolution operates. And what that means is that we can't just look at one or other of these processes in isolation. We really need to start moving towards a... a or we need to start building the theoretical tools that will allow us to bring these two things together. Because it changes the game entirely when we look at uh, biological evolution. And then I'm going to conclude um, with, I, I, I suppose, three uh, lessons I think that we can draw from this um, for trying to look for explanations for universal properties of human language. Okay. So first, the experiments. Um, so I guess, ooh, I don't know, um, five, six, seven years ago, it seemed a, an odd idea that we could do experiments um, in language evolution. Um, it, it's, it, it seemed like there were very, very few experimental psychologists in our discipline. And that's changed enormously. I mean, if you just look at the, the kinds of things that are presented here and, and look at the kinds of things that people in various labs are doing, it's a very exciting change, is the, is the introduction of the psychologists into this uh, field. But it's, it's understandable why it seems like, well, how on earth could you build experiments that would tell you anything about uh, the evolution of language? Um, but we think we can, um, and we can actually study iterated learning in uh, the experiment lab. Um, so the idea here is to try and build um, in miniature um, a model using real human participants of the, cult the process of cultural evolution. And in particular, we're interested in the cultural evolution of uh, languages. So the way this works is we set up what's essentially like a uh, telephone game, but with whole languages. Now, I don't know if you have this game in Japan, um, but it's, it's a kid's game where um, I would whisper a sentence into Luke's ear, um, and Luke would whisper that sentence into his um, neighbor's ear, and then they'd pass around the room. And uh, the funny thing about the, the game is by the end, the sentence has changed out of all recognition. But in that process of change, the, the funny things that can happen are funny because they reveal something about the, the minds of uh, the people uh, this sentence has passed through. So does, does this happen in Japan? Some countries don't do it. Oh, good. I'm glad you lot do. That's excellent. Okay, so 
So this telephone game, as it's called in, in America, um, uh, is played with just single sentences. But we had the idea that maybe we could play this game but with whole languages. Um, so the, the task is that we bring a participant into the lab and we teach them a miniature alien language. And we call it an alien language on the posters to advertise for participants because we get more participants if we call it an alien language than any other way. Um, <clears throat> so we teach the teacher participant in our lab this alien language and then we test them on it. Now at this point, it, there's nothing unusual about this. This is a standard technique and um, goes back uh, uh, many decades um, of artificial language learning or artificial grammar learning. Um, um, and indeed, Jenny Safran in her plenary will undoubtedly be talking about uh, experiments like this but carried out with children. So at this point, this is a this is completely standard method from uh, psychology. Um, but what we do then is take the uh, participant's output on test and use that as the training data for the next participant that comes in the lab. So we were able to start this um, uh, experiment off with a particular language that we control, but after, from that point it's out of our control, so the language will change as it's passed from participant to participant through the experiment. Um, so, and the idea here is that we, um, um, we can use this technique to uh, study the way the cultural evolutionary process works, given particular human brains. Now, it's very important to realize that there's some um, rather serious limitations with this. Um, for example, importantly, uh, the participants already have language, um, and that's something that we have to take into account. But that, um, it's important to realize that what these experiments are about it, aren't studying necessarily those individual human brains, but studying the process of cultural transmission. So we can make modifications to the setup of the experiments and see what different behaviors result in the dynamics of the transmission of the language. And then, ideally, we um, pair up these lab experiments with computational models to try and work out what's the best explanation for the behavior that we see. But all the way through, we should be kind of humble about the fact that we have participants in these experiments that already have language. So that's obviously going to um, affect the results. OK. Um, so sorry, some of the images are missing here but um, for some reason. So this is our, the first study. So this was um, uh, published back in uh, 2008 with uh, this joint work with Hannah Cornish and Kenny Smith. And this is the first study that we did where we tried this um, experimental methodology. And in this uh, experiment, the participants learn strings of syllables like these, um, paired with structured meanings. Okay, so um, what I mean by a structured meaning is that the participants were told that the aliens were going to, uh, you, they were going to hear the alien words for various colored moving shapes. So for example, this blue bouncing ball might be called Kalu. For example, um, the language that we started with in the experiment was a random, completely unstructured pairing between uh, these pictures and these strings. There was nothing, uh, we just got a computer to generate random sequences of syllables and pair them with the, um, with the pictures. Um, and the training data for each participant in the experiment was, the subs was a subset of the output of the previous participant in the experiment. Um, uh, oh, there's the pictures, that's nice. Um, so, uh, and a crucial step uh, that we found that we had to add to this experiment um, was that at each generation, in scare quotes, uh, after each participant produced um, their output, we had to artificially remove any ambiguous items. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, uh, later. So, <coughs> So you as a participant in our experiment would see a bunch of these pictures paired with strings, um, and then you would be tested on um, other pictures. You'd be tested on ones that you saw, but you'd potentially also be tested on uh, pictures that you hadn't seen. But our participants didn't know that. So in fact, there's very, very low awareness in this experiment that um, they were ever even being tested on unseen pictures. So you can imagine if you saw these three words um, and then 
you, you may find it relatively easy to recall them, but if you, if you imagine only seeing two of them and you were asked to uh, generalize, if you like, to the unseen one, then, well, you basically have no chance. But our participants were, had to do it anyway. Okay, so we were interested in what happens in this process of transmission of a very simple artificial language like this. So what happens to the language as, like in the telephone game, various kind of errors in copying happen from uh, participant to participant. So I'll just give you, in each of these um, studies, I'm just going to show you the output rather than any quantitative data. Don't worry, it is there. Um, but I just wanted to give you a sort of flavor of what happens. And this is just a tiny subset of the language. So here's our, um, a subset of our random language at the first generation of the experiment, if you like. And this is what it looked like after being passed through 10 um, individuals, um, 10 generations later. Now, one of the interesting things is that the participants are incredibly bad at this task. So they're un they, they essentially cause a score zero. They get zero correct in the early generations. But by the end, they um, are getting a very, very high score. So they're learning the language incredibly well. And if you look at it, you might be able to see why. Whereas you can't generalize this language from a subsample, you can generalize this one from a subsample. And it, it becomes easier to see if I put, if I artificially add hyphens in here. So what's happened is that in this process of transmission, um, a compositional structure has emerged. So there are parts of these strings that correspond to color, parts that correspond to movement, and parts that correspond to shape. And that's just emerged out of this process of repeated learning and production and learning and production in, in the lab experiment. And none of our participants were aware, certainly they weren't aware of the structure of the experiment, and most of them were just told us basically that they, well, all of them told us that they were doing their best to just give us back what we gave them. And yet, somehow in this process, this compositional structure has emerged. So the conclusion from that first experiment was that this um, transmission of language from one individual to the next individual to the next individual, something that in cultural evolution terms we call vertical transmission, with this artificial pressure to avoid ambiguity that we added, recall that we, um, we throw away any items in the output that are ambiguous. So if some participant used the same string, same signal for two different meanings, we threw it out. Those things together um, give us compositionality. And this is an extremely robust result. It's been re replicated by a number of labs, and I know some other labs are currently uh, rerunning this experiment, various different settings, the same result. It's one of the most robust um, results that we've, we've, we've had in, an, in experimental context in Edinburgh. Um, and also it's been demonstrated in a huge <coughs> range of computational simulations using techniques as, uh, as diverse as neural networks to um, uh, minimum description length grammar inducers. A variety of different um, techniques give us this result. Um, but notice I ha we had to do this thing, slightly strange thing of artificially removing ambiguous items from the language. So what's going on there? Why did we need that? Well, we decided to run a new experiment, and this is joint work with Monica Tamaris, Hannah Cornish, Kenny Smith, Sean Roberts, um, oh, and myself. Um, and uh, this is not yet published, but um, papers on this are in, in preparation at the moment. So we wanted to see if we could remove that artificial step of throwing out ambiguous strings. Um, so we did a new version of the experiment where instead of just having one person at each generation in the experiment, um, we moved to two individuals. And these two individuals, this dyad in this experiment, interact, they communicate over a, a computer terminal um, in a, a kind of a naming game task. So the, the pairs in our study interact to try and pick a particular picture from a distractor array using the alien language that they've learned. Um, and once these two participants have played this game for a while, then we take their behavior and use that as the training data for the next pair of participants in the experiment. In all other um, senses, it's very, very similar to the previous experiment. 
So we just had these dyads interacting at each generation. And we took away this kind of weird filtering step that we had to add in the previous study. And what we find is essentially adding this communicative task um, does the work for us. It, it creates structure without needing this um, ambiguity filtering that we previously had to have. So this is an example of the, uh, the end result of one of our um, experiments. Uh, slightly simpler meaning space actually here, so there's only two features, there's shape and texture. But again, I hope you can see that we have a compositional language emerging here. So the uh, prefix here corresponds to shape, and the suffix corresponds to the texture, and we also have sort of an unmarked case that's emerged here. It doesn't, doesn't happen every time, but in this case, in this uh, particular run of the experiment, we have an unmarked uh, texture there. So that second study, um, the conclusion we draw from that is that vertical transmission combined with the communicative task uh, gives us this compositionality that we were looking for. So these two things at least seem to, seem to be required. But what about this vertical transmission? How important is that? How, this is, uh, recall this is the uh, process of transmitting a language from one generation to the next. So we wanted to see how important that was. So we, wanted, we decided to make a very minor change to that previous study. Um, and rather, ha rather than having different pairs of individuals at each generation, different people playing in these dyads, we actually just had uh, one dyad um, for each uh, run of the experiment. So basically, it was exactly the same setup, but we just kept the same two people in the lab for a very long time. Um, so they learned the language, they played the naming game, then they learned their own output again, and played the naming game again, and so on. So in, in, in all other aspects, it's the same. So just the same two people instead of different people each time. So a very minor um, change. But the important thing here is that there's, there's, a, there's kind of no turnover in the population. There's no transmission of the language to naive new learners. Um, so this is, some, this is akin in uh, cultural evolution terms to horizontal transmission rather than vertical transmission. So what are the differences, if any? Uh, the differences, I mean, this really startled me, actually. Um, uh, it couldn't be more different. So the results, um, essentially, we get no or almost no compositionality at all in this experiment. So... Uh, so... Uh, this language is an example of one at the end of one of our experiments. Uh, now, it's important to realize that the dyad is using this language perfectly well. They, they can communicate perfectly, have no problem with it, but there's no, there's no or very, very little compositional structure here. Um, so the, the, the language has stayed as this kind of idiosyncratic, random pairing of uh, syllables to meanings. So what we conclude from that is that What's really crucial for the emergence of compositionality, at least in these experiments, is a combination of naive learners and communication. So these two things seem to be important. If we don't have communication, um, then uh, we need some other process to stop the language becoming just completely ambiguous. Um, and if we don't have transmission to naive learners through vertical, uh, vertical transmission, then we don't get the structure at all. So the way we're, we're starting to think about this um, is to try and think of um, the, the structure of the languages that's coming out in this um, process as arising as a trade-off between uh, compressibility and expressivity. So, um, and these two features of the languages that come out are driven on the one hand by learning and on the other by communication. So what do I mean by compressibility. Well, if you look at that compositional language that we get in this um, experiment, it can be expressed in a, in a simple grammar with fewer rules, fewer things need to be stored in the representation of that language than in the language that has complete idiosyncrasy. So the representational space that that language takes up is smaller than in the idiosyncratic language. And that sort of crunching down of the language, uh, we're hypothesizing it is being driven by learning um, 
But the most crunched down language you could have, the simplest language you could possibly acquire, would be a language that just used one word for everything. So you could just unk for every meaning. That's a very, very simple grammar. Representational uh, complexity is, is, is very low. But it's incredibly inexpressive. It doesn't distinguish between meanings. So these two forces, this force to um, reduce the representational um, space of a language and, um, and yet distinguish between different meanings, uh, are in opposition to each other. And they're driven by these two features of uh, the um, process of cultural transmission, uh, learning and communication. And our hypothesis is that much of the structural properties of language are the result of this trade-off between expressivity and compressibility. And we've replicated this recently um, in a uh, uh, exemplar-based simulation showing that uh, vertical transmission and communication are required to get these properties out. Now, an interesting um, sort of uh, corollary of this, I guess, is that what we should see is this complexity, which is uh, non-compressibility of language, lots of idiosyncrasy, for example. If we do see it in real languages, it should arise in social contexts where there is uh, uh, more shared interaction history, so less transmission to naive learners. So if I was to predict that there'd be a relationship between um, how compress compressible a language was and features of the social context, I would predict that in languages where um, uh, there are small populations with, um, with people always talking to the same um, uh, interaction partners, those would be the cases where you'll get more complex languages. And that rather pleasingly lines up with the kinds of results that Gary Lupian and Rick Dale found in their uh, normothetic study of uh, language and social structure. So that's quite pleasing. You can find out more about all of this experiment in uh, Monica Tamariz's talk at five past three on Friday if you're interested in the details. <coughs> okay, so moving on. In, 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 in all of these experiments I've talked about so far in these three studies, um, we've been seeing essentially strings of syllables um, adapting to a particular set of meanings that we, the experimenters, have provided. So we wondered what would happen if we ran a similar experiment but took the meanings out. So we're just looking at um, um, just transmitting sequences, essentially. And take, in fact, take out all of the kind of linguistic context altogether and just present it to participants as a sequence learning task. So we set up um, this experiment uh, where participants just sat down and were exposed to sequences of um, uh, symbols. And they were simply learned, uh, asked to learn to re reproduce these symbols um, it's an incredibly boring experiment to just to see some sequences and then type them in. Um, we uh, started with a random set of sequences, so um, a maximum um, entropy set of uh, sequences of characters. And we included a constraint that participants must produce a fixed number of distinct sequences. So participants were exposed to um, a certain number of distinct sequences, and they were told that they had to reproduce that same number of distinct sequences, and the computer would, um, would throw up an error if they typed in one of the sequences twice. So note that that's standing in for this pressure to be expressive. Uh, and this is the, these are the kinds of results um, that we got. So this is joint work with Hannah Cornish, Rick Dale, and Morton Christensen. Um, so this is a random sequence of uh, 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 characters in, at the start of an experiment. And this is um, a number of generations later through this uh, vertical transmission process. And what you can see here, I hope, it's actually we're still looking for good quantitative measures for measuring structure here. So if anyone's got any ideas, talk to Hannah. Um, but uh, visually, certainly, it's very clear that what's happening here is that structure is emerging. So there are subsequences that are reused. In fact, in this case, there's an interesting property of um, palindromes started to appear. So we have sequences here um, whose structure um, is essentially um, uh, context-free, if you want to <laughs> take it down that road. But the, the important point is that this... Uh, set of uh, uh, sequences, the uh, participants are able to learn and recall these much, much better than those. So in this process of transmission, 
the, the set of strings became easier to learn by virtue of uh, gaining structure. So what do we conclude from that? So in, in this non-linguistic sequence learning task, even without meanings, this iterated learning process leads to this emergence of repeating subsequences. And our, our hypothesis is that this might provide um, a, a, essentially a kind of foundation on which um, uh, more structure can emerge. And I wouldn't be surprised if a process like this wasn't going on in uh, some uh, songbirds that culturally transmit their song. That structure, repeating um, uh, more compressible structure emerges as purely as a result of cultural transmission. Um, so the last study I want to talk about um, takes this work in a, in a kind of new direction. So all of all of the studies I've been talking about so far have been kind of focusing on the compositionality end of things. But what about combinatoriality? So all of this previous work has already given our participants on, on, you know, on the shelf a, uh, an already combinatorial signal system. So we have combinations of syllables or combinations of uh, symbols on a keyboard. So these are the elements that are meaningless and can be recombined. So we give that to the participants. But what we would like to do is see if, if this cultural transmission process could give us those elements in the first place. So can we get from a, um, a system of signals that doesn't have that combinatorial structure to one that does? Um, and this is joint work with uh, Tessa Verhoof, Carol Padden, and Bart de Boer. Um, and the idea was essentially to repeat that previous study that looked at just strings of syllables, but use a signaling medium that was continuous. And we hit upon this idea of using uh, swanny whistles. Um, <laughs> and this is a really fun experiment. So um, all of our previous experiments, participants hated us for it. But for some reason, maybe it was because of Tessa, um, participants loved this experiment. So they really enjoyed being in the lab and playing with the swanny whistles. Um, but it's essentially the same uh, paradigm. We started with a collection of random whistle sounds um, created by a large number of participants that had no internal structure. And each participant um, heard uh, the whistle sound and had to try and repeat it using the, this swanny whistle, this slide whistle. Um, and the computer would record it, um, and participants had to try and recall the entire set of uh, whistles that they heard. Um, and just as in the previous experiment, there was this the computer provided this constraint that they had to produce a sufficient number of distinct signals. So the software is able to tell on the fly whether a, a, a whistle sound that you produced was essentially too similar to one that you'd already produced. Again, this is this um, pressure that we're building into this experiment for expressivity. So this is the, kind, this is the sort of things that we get out of this experiment. Um, so I don't worry, you don't have to read this. But the point is that we, we can get pitch track data from uh, these experiments and see, so go, coming down the slide is time. So this is the initial set of um, sequences of um, whistles. And then down here is the uh, set produced by our, the tenth participant in this particular vertical transmission chain. I can zoom in on part of that. Um, and this is the sort of things that um, are uh, kind of fascinating in this study that we see these kinds of things emerging. So what you can see here is uh, in these six different uh, whistle signals that there's a reuse of elements. So there's this um, down up element here and then these the repeating single notes that appear um, on different sides and in different number of notes. And what the participant is able to do is reproduce the set of sequences that they hear because they're involved, they, they consist of these sub-elements, these meaningless elements that they can recombine in different orders. And in fact, there's also um, interesting uh, uh, kind of phonotactic constraints in this system. So we typically find kind of rules that say certain combinations don't happen. And those are kind of language specific. So at different times that the experiment is run, different um, effects emerge. And even things like 
uh, kind of co-articulation effects, so that we have certain subsequences that occur at the same pitch as one of these uh, fall rises. Um, now, so what do we conclude from that? Um, so the conclusion here is that structure can em emerge in which elements are reused along with constraints and combinations just, again, just by this process of iterated learning. Um, you can find out much more about this in Tessa's talk at 2.25 on Friday, um, so it's just like a, a very quick summary. And one of the things that's exciting about this work is that it suggests a different explanation for phonemic coding, coding than some of the ones that are in the literature. So here, phonemic coding, we suggest, doesn't rely on pressure from a large number of signals, as some have, hy um, have hypothesized, but rather as a result of purely as a result of this cultural transmission process. Okay, so the overall conclusions from the experiment section of the talk. Uh, so cultural transmission through this iterated learning process has a significant effect on the structure of the behaviors being transmitted. Um, so what we want to say is if the following is true, that there is a large system to acquire. In other words, there is something that we call a learning bottleneck, so that participants can't simply trivially um, uh, memorize all of the features of the signaling system or the language that we're exposing them to. If that exists, and there is a pressure on the system to discriminate different meanings or different uh, signals, um, in other words, that it's used for communication, so if you have these two things, a pressure, a learning pressure and a, um, a communication pressure, then our argument is that these basic design features of combinatoriality and compositionality emerge as a trade-off between compressibility and expressivity. Now bear in mind that what I've shown you is results from um, experiments using, as I said before, using uh, participants that already have language. So it could be that what we're seeing is just we're getting back the features of the language that we acquired. The problem with that hypothesis is that we see the same results in computer simulation where we can control exactly what our computational agents have in their heads. And it seems to us that a uh, the more parsimonious explanation that is this is purely a result of the dynamics um, imposed by iterated learning itself. Now, I promised you I would talk about the impact of all of this on our biology. And so for um, the next quite brief section, I'm going to do that. So I'm going to be presenting this view that cultural transmission, cultural transmission is all that, right? Cultural transmission is really the game in town for explaining language structure. But I really don't want to dismiss the role of biological evolution. Um, I mean, one way in which our work can be taken is to say that um, these features of language structure aren't innate. Essentially, that they can just be, they just emerge out of the process of cultural transmission. They don't have to be encoded in any way in our language faculty. Um, but these structural properties of language appear to be very adaptive, right? They, they would appear to provide us as a species with enormous advantages. And you just have to look at the demographics of um, us compared to other primate species to see that that's obviously true. The fact that we have language and the knock-on consequence language has certainly seems to provide us with an advantage. So perhaps one might argue that um, um, natural selection should be the mechanism that we're looking for to provide these properties, in some sense, as strong innate constraints. So surely it makes sense if these properties of language are adaptive, then natural selection would um, encode them in some way in our language faculty. Um, and so to try and you know, bridge that hypothesis with the work we're doing, perhaps what we could say is that this cultural process that I've been talking about, this cultural evolutionary process, could lead to stable universals of language structure that then bootstraps biological evolution through some kind of genetic assimilation. So this is the idea that if we're all speaking these languages that have these structure by virtue of cultural evolution, then uh, biological evolution could end up encoding 
those in our genes, and therefore we could end up with a language faculty that is innately wired up to expect compositionality and combinatoriality. And indeed, that's a hypothesis that I proposed uh, with Jim Herford in 1987, and Christensen, Reale, and Chater have written about in various places. So the idea that if cultural evolution can give us some stable universals to work with, then sure, biological evolution can encode those. And um, more discussion about these models, um, you can look at Vanessa Ferdinand's uh, poster um, in the poster session, which I think is today. But a model that we've been working on um, this year has a very, to my mind, a rather surprising conclusion that uh, the answer to that is a resounding no. Okay. So the cultural process can never lead to uh, the evolution of strong innate constraints. In fact, it seems that the existence of cultural transmission, iterated learning, actually completely removes the possibility of strong innate constraints to arise through natural selection. Um, that's a rather surprising conclusion. So I'll, I'll just give you a flavor of, of the model. Um, and this is a model with Bill Thompson and Kenny Smith. Um, so what we wanted to do was combine what we knew about learning, uh, what we knew about uh, cultural evolution through iterated learning, and biological evolution in one model. And what we did was we uh, simulated a population of individuals, uh, individual agents, that acquire language through uh, iterated learning. And crucially, what we did in this model was we used a technique that allowed us to specify a complete continuum of innateness from um, very, very weak biases so that our agents would be born with a tiny expectation that languages would have one um, kind of feature or another to completely strong constraints so that the uh, individuals were born only able to learn certain types of languages. And the way we did that is we specified this continuum um, as an additive effect of many genes in the model. Now we used a Bayesian approach for this. And I want to point out here um, that this kind of flexibility of modeling, which um, allows you to include kind of many of the standard uh, nativist models as special cases, is exactly the kind of thing that Bayesian modeling is good for, um, despite what you might have heard. It's, it's an incredibly powerful technique. It lets us um, it lets us specify a continuum from strong innateness on, one, on the one hand to domain general, completely um, uh, uh, uninformative learning on the other. Um, so it's, it's not, using that technique doesn't tie you to a particular stance on the evolution of language or the nature of cognition. It's a, just a very powerful technique that allows you to explore a um, very wide space of models. Um, and we implemented natural selection in this model by favoring coordination. So agents who uh, communicate well um, are favored. And, even, and we even tried uh, implementing natural selection for particular language types, because we wanted to see, are there any conditions under which we could um, get strong innate constraints to evolve? So if we thought, well, you know, the, the best case scenario for the evolution of innateness is if We've, we reward individuals for speaking a particular language in this model. Surely then we would find natural selection encoding that language innately. And it turns out that it doesn't, and it's a, it's a surprising result. Um, so I, I can only really give you a very brief overview. Um, I encourage you to go to Bill's talk, um, I think it's later today. Um, this is one graph from the paper, and what it shows here is that these two lines are, this is time along this axis. Um, the dashed line is the kind of external manifestation of language, it's the behavior of the agents. And what we see here is emerging um, a strong universal. So these uh, agents all speak a particular type of language, um, and there's very little variation in the population. But what this isn't matched by the genes. So this is the language faculty in the model. And what we end up, is, uh, end up with again and again and again is strong universals of behavior not being matched by strong innateness. Universals can and do emerge sometimes, but strong innate constraints on the learners never evolve. 
And we see this result replicated with, we've tried 12 different versions of this model. We've tried to find all possible ways we could to get uh, basically this line to track that one um, to strong constraints, and it never happens. So why is this? Um, well, like, just very briefly, um, what seems to be happening is that cultural transmission radically alters the relationship between genes that control learning and population-wide behavior. Um, so this evolutionary dynamics in this model lead to iterated learning, this cultural process, amplifying the effect of learning biases. Um, and what this means from the point of view of natural selection, um, and this is in sort of uh, Terry Deacon's terms, um, culture unmasks the effect of small biases. So small biases in, in individuals can have a huge effect in the um, behavior being selected. Um, being the, that's the target of selection. But at the same time, it masks the effect of strong constraints. So what you find is that the, um, uh, the genes produce a very, very weak bias that's completely defeasible in the, in, in, for one individual, uh, but nevertheless has these strong universals. So you can find out more, as I say, from Bill's talk today at 10 past 12. Okay, so just to conclude, I think from this, this kind of work, looking in detail at the effects of cultural evolution on um, uh, models of the emergence of language structure, there's kind of three, I guess, take-home lessons that I'd want to suggest to you. So where does language structure come from? Well, I think it's a reasonable first hypothesis, at least, to explore that it's possibly all of language structure is essentially a trade-off between compressibility and expressivity. And that trade-off is driven by cultural evolution under pressures from learning and communication. What about the language faculty? Well, I think we can rule out a language faculty that encodes strong constraints as a result of selection for communication. But, and this is important, this does not rule out what uh, Chomsky calls third factor principles. So if we do find that there are features of the language faculty that correspond to strong constraints on the form of languages, we would predict that they are not going to be the result of natural selection for communication. So it's a very counterintuitive argument. But our results say very clearly that you either have weak biases that are the result of natural selection for communication, or potentially strong constraints that are the result of some other process. Now, that I would be perfectly happy for none of those to exist or for there many, to be many of them. I just want to say that this work doesn't rule those out. And finally, which design features should compar a comparative biology of language look for? I have not talked very much about this, but I think a logical conclusion of this work is that really we shouldn't be looking for these features like compositionality and combinatoriality in other species. I mean, it's, it's interesting that if we find... Um, if we find them. But really what I think we should be looking for is um, the pre-adaptations for language. And from our point of view, the kind of design features that we should be looking for in other species are things like traditional uh, transmission, which we find in, in birds, for example, and social coordination, which we, where we find hints of it in other primates. And um, that's a rather old picture of the AC. It's always this sunny in Edinburgh, so come and visit us. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have uh, not so long, eight minutes or okay. But, uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, very interesting uh, overview of uh, learning and uh, uh, but I wanted to ask something about your, your last point about the evolution of constraint. Mm. Um, would this also exclude the ability to evolve biological adaptations like the ability to learn larger lexicons or the ability to evolve um, the possibility to produce large ranges of sounds? Because I would be really unhappy with that. No, don't, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's strictly, it's. Um, constraints on, it's, it, it, it predicts that we won't have um, 
natural selection giving us strong constraints on uh, the form of languages as a result of selection for communication. So uh, the, su the kind of support apparatus for language, the, um, though, th uh, as I understand the models, those are not ruled out as, as being the results of um, selection. However, I wouldn't pin an enormous amount of hope on those. I mean, personally, I don't think that there's likely to be masses of, uh, masses of ongoing biological evolution after the linguistic system has got off the ground. I mean, because that's what you would need. You would need to say, okay, languages have emerged, and then there are, there are significant processes of biological evolution afterwards. I, I mean, this work doesn't talk to that, but my hunch is that there may be slight tweaking of, of, of different um, parts of our, our kind of support apparatus, but I don't imagine that there necessarily is a huge amount. Um, but no, the, the, the models are strictly talking about constraints on um, and biases on learning. That's all. Sorry, I'm your cherry. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and there. Uh, or who? Oh, no, 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 no. Anyone in the microphone? Thank you for the stimulating tool thing. I have a question about your uh, uh, experiment number three with the naming game, uh -huh. which you do not observe the emergence of any composition. Yeah. And that's a very nice result. But uh, I was wondering, what would happen if you let just two agents play, but you enlarge a lot the set of meanings? At that point, probably the meaning game would become a, a like, sort of category game, and they would be forced to. to so ba basically, what's happened to the law code? Because they couldn't remember <coughs> the proper name of any single shape. So one of the, one of the problems of doing these kind of lab experiments, they're, they're small scale experiments, so everything's scaled down. So you've got parameters, um, you've got free parameters. So so. Um, you know, these aren't the size of languages, and, but they're also the time that we've got participants isn't a, a lifespan, right? So in any experiment, you have there's a, a process of tweaking, for example, the size of the meaning space to make certain results happen. What I would say is that what we expect in all of these cases is that the process of um, learning by that first layer of the system is going to have an effect. But, but then that's that, right? So you'll have, if, if you enlarge the meaning space, yes, you might well have some compositional structure, and then it would kind of ossify, it would get frozen in place because these participants would have enough time to, to uh, learn the system. It's, it's the process of transmission to naive learners that has that cumulative effect where the system has to keep getting crunched down. So, um, uh, yeah, but of course, if you make it so large, that it's it's um, it's unlearnable. Then I suspect you you, you would get more structure. Um, sorry, you, sorry. Uh, I'm going to ask for a very interesting talk. Uh, from Pavlovsky University of Warsaw. Actually, my question relates to the question that Andrea has asked. Um, so basically, in your model, you observe the emergence of compositionality through the process of imperfect learning from the initial stage where you didn't have uh, ostensible compositionality there. Now I was wondering to what extent this tells you something about the nature of uh, language other than the nature of uh, the way we conceptualize things. Mm -hmm. Because it would be, I, I would normally think that when you've got the first speaker there, and they express a property that uh, is uh, in some way composed of different elements, they would want to use terms that they use for those yeah. elements yeah. there. So the starting stage would be different. Uh, the, and is this, does this model tell you something about the language or the way or the stage before uh, the linguistic output okay. actually? I, I, very briefly, I mean, we, the version of the experiment without that uh, filtering step that I talked about where we remove ambiguity, uh, you don't get compositional structure, right? So, so the, the uh, and that, that's, that's kind of important, that the compositional structure uh, arises from this, this uh, implicit drive to keep meanings apart. And, and, and in that first experiment, that was a, 
um, an addition that we made as experimenters that the participants couldn't possibly know. They, so participants couldn't know whether they're in a condition where they were having some of their uh, output thrown out or not. And yet the, re the result is very different. So I think that compositional structure isn't a straightforward result of the kind of um, way in which individuals can conceptualize. However, I have students working on conceptual structure and we're, we're trying to see whether, and in fact we've shown some results where the languages that come out reflect um, uh, distinctions in the domain, uh, a, a domain of uh, meanings that are relevant to a particular task. So possibly a discrimination task. So I think we can see, I, I'm, I'm confident that the same techniques can look at the evolution, the kind of cultural evolution of, if you like, the meaning space as well as the support space. Um, I think these are these are kind of part and parcel of the same thing. Uh, two comments and two questions. So you stress culture, culture transmission, culture, you know, uh, inheritance. But there are you know a number of languages that never had any contact, never. Like Italian and Berber, they are both pro-drop languages. And then you have near you have France, you know, which is close to Italy. It is a non pro drop language. And you have valleys close to one another that have been so. You know, there was no cultural transmission there. And another case is home science that Susan Goldin Mello has been studying. You know, there is no transmission. These are deaf children from here in Peru. There is no cultural transmission or whatsoever. And they have the organization that they have it in their language. So my question is, how do we account for this? You know, after stressing so much cultural evolution. And then my second question, do you really think that the only way that something can be fixed, you know, is through natural selection? Is that the only way you can have something genetically fixed? So, uh, both good questions. So, the first question, uh, it, it, I think what you're getting at is that you can see in these different systems uh, universal properties um, and that to you would be mysterious um, if I was, uh, since I'm arguing they arrive, uh, arrive through cultural transmission. But that's, that, that's and to my mind, that's kind of beside the point. I mean, what we're saying is that we can explain universal properties of language as being, if you like, attractors in the, uh, the space of dynamical systems that, let me finish, that cultural transmission produces. So for example, I would expect um, that in a process, for example, a, ni a, nice, a nice case study would be to compare Nicaraguan sign language and the al Sai Bedouin sign language. In those two systems, what we've seen is the emergence of these universal properties I've been talking about. Um, in Nicaraguan sign language, we have both compositionality and complementoriality. In the, in the ABSL case, we don't have one of them. And the, the argument is that in these two cases, we have slightly different processes of social transmission. And, um, I'm so talking different, not universal. I'm talking not sorry, sorry. Uh, well, there are, diff there are different attractors, but can I answer the second? No, okay. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so difference is fine as well, right? I mean, these are different stable points in, um, in the space of cultural transmission. Your other question was about um, fixation. I didn't really talk about fixation, but I am happy to concede that there, are, there could be properties of the, na of the language faculty that are strongly constraining, that are universal, that have nothing to do with natural selection for communication. So in, in many ways, um, I support some aspects of the program that you're part of. I think they may not be necessary, but nothing in what, nothing what I have said has ruled out the possibility that there are, for example, computational constraints or architectural constraints or um, exaptations from other features of our biology. I think they're all plausible, interesting candidates. I, I, I really don't think that we, in this field, are in a position to take one stance versus another, and I think it's a mistake if we do. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think